so welcome to the type two panel. Um, this is the best type, it's my type. <laughs> <laughs> Who knew? Who knew? Just kidding, no, of course, that's what pride would say, and pride is a central feature of uh, Enneagram Type 2, which is a little bit of a tricky concept that hopefully we'll get our arms at least partway around today. So Type 2 is the first type in the heart triad that we'll, talk, that we'll look at today. Um, type 2, uh, the heart triad is uh, the three types that are centered in the heart center. So as you know, we all have three centers of intelligence, all of us. Uh, but our type determines which of the three centers we kind of live from more, come from more, that we're sort of out of balance in sort of overemphasizing uh, the presence of one way of uh, interacting with the world, whether it's through action and gut knowing and instinctual behavior from the gut center, through emotion, relationships, empathy from the heart center, uh, or through the head center, uh, types five, six, and seven which are based in thinking and cognition. So today we talk about our heart types, um, heart types that are based in the heart that come more from emotion than the other two centers, although sometimes it's kind of tricky to understand what center you come from. For instance, ones sometimes type can be typed as sort of head centers, they tend to be very intellectual, um, and yet they're body-based centers, so it can be a little bit tricky to self-diagnose what center you live in. Uh, but twos, threes, and fours generally uh, come more from emotion uh, in ways they see sometimes and also in ways they don't see. Um, and they're also associated with the core emotion of sadness or grief at loss. Uh, the head types are associated with fear as kind of a central factor that shapes their character. The body types, eight, nine, and one, are associated with anger, uh, and they each act out anger in a different way. Um, the two, three, and fours, they're based in sadness. Uh, and where that sadness sometimes comes from is the heart types, all three heart types, sometimes get in a message that they're not loved for who they really are in childhood. They get a message that they're loved for what they do or how they look or what they do for other people or whether they perform well. So the three heart types have in common this sense of kind of creating an image uh, and twos and threes are shapeshifters and that they create an image that's designed to get approval or like or liking or love or affection from others. Um, twos, threes, and fours do that in three different ways. Twos focus on being liked, on gaining the approval of others, on pleasing people as a way of getting their needs met. Uh, twos in childhood often had a sense that, um, they often had an experience of not getting their needs met. Uh, parental figures, caretakers weren't really there, didn't really fulfill their needs. And so unconsciously, twos take on this idea that there's something wrong with my needs. And they tend to go unconscious to their needs because it's a big source of pain to have a need and have it not get taken care of. Uh, so they tend to go into taking care of others as an indirect way of getting others to take care of them. Sometimes this can be through charming people or seducing people. Sometimes it can be through helping and giving. And I personally, as a two myself, um, think that the helping and giving associated with two has been a little bit overemphasized. I definitely think that we tend to be supportive people, very much in the foreground of our attention is uh, what other people need, how we can be useful, how we can be supportive to others. Uh, but really it's important to know that, that when we offer help, it's strategic help, right? It's very important because sometimes twos can be seen as just being the sort of, in a in kind of a simplistic way, helping others, giving others. And sometimes people don't see the dark side of two, or they don't see the complicated na nature of twos, uh, that when they give and support, they're off, it's often a means to an end. And sometimes the two themselves is very unconscious about that. Uh, they may just think, well, I'm just being nice, or I just feel supportive of others, or I just want, I, I feel generous uh, in a good way. And certainly twos can be very altruistic and very generous uh, in a very sincere way. But oftentimes, again, in a way that even uh, can be uh, not seen by the two themselves, 
uh, they can sort of give to get, or they can um, lavish praise on someone, hoping that person will see them in a positive light. They can do things for others, hoping that when they're in need, people will do things for them without having to ask. Because more than anything, twos fear rejection, because relationships and connecting with people, creating positive rapport is so central. Uh, and so when things threaten that, uh, that can be hard. Um, and because of all that, twos, Twos have this sort of unconscious need to walk around with a positive view of themselves uh, so that they can make connections with others uh, and so that they can feel confident in forming those all important relationships that are really uh, key and at the center of their focus. And sometimes uh, what, what happens is, uh, is that, the, that the two can almost feel like they need to be superhuman, uh, to take care of everyone's needs, to be supportive of everyone. Uh, but this is pride. And pride can be a little bit hard to understand in the Enneagram sense, partly because it's synonymous with a good thing. Like, it's good to have be proud of yourself, to feel good about, about yourself. But this is pride in a slightly different sense. It's pride is in Dante's sense, as in the lowest pit of hell is where uh, <laughs> the Satan who committed the sin of pride lives. Right, so this, it's sort of pride in that sense and not just the pride and I feel good about myself sense. And what does that mean? It simply means that sometimes there's a way that twos, and again, often in a very unconscious way, can present themselves as something they're not in or because they, on some level, believe they need to be bigger than they are. They need to be more powerful. And simply put, pride is a desire for, for importance. Uh, it's a kind of need to see yourself as important in the lives of others, in the world, uh, so that you can uh, attract other people, so that you can engineer relationships and, and things like that. So I don't want to say too much more because I want to let the twos talk about how this plays out for them in their life. Uh, but that's hopefully an introduction uh, to, to two. And uh, I may add in a little bit more here and there since this is my type. But for the most part, I want to hear from our uh, really excellent two panel. I want to thank you all for being here today. We have Randy, Michael, Kathy, Jerry, and Deborah on our panel today. And I believe they're even sitting in the order of subtypes. So we'll <laughs> talk about subtypes a little bit later uh, on in the panel. So Randy, can we talk with you and start off a little bit? Can you say a little bit about how you discovered you were two, how, what your experience has been being a two? What's the main focus of attention? Um. That's a lot of questions. That is. <laughs> I think I, I think I got. Well, let me uh, take a swag whichever. out of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that I I um, was going through. It's funny. It's just listening to you. It feels like you're playing my piano, and mm. I get really vulnerable just listening mm. to what you're saying. So, because mm -hmm. um, uh, it's so accurate. Uh, for me, mm. I was um, I started studying the Enneagram like nine years ago. And what happened was I was at work. I, I took on a new job that was much more challenging. And I had a boss that I really liked, uh, this person I really, really liked. But as soon as I started working, she was a good friend of mine for years. And then as soon as I started working for her, she kind of changed into this beast, you know. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, so uh, I was complaining to this friend of mine and just saying, I think I'm going to have to quit my job. I had been at the job for at um, the University of California for like 24 years. And I thought, wow, here's my career is just going to go down the tubes. And so she hooked me up with an Enneagram teacher. With this, she used to study with Helen. And and I started, uh, she gave me the, the types to read, and it just, two just resonated with me uh, because of the people aspect and the giving aspect. And I've always been emotional. You know, my mm. mom used to say, uh, we were at a funeral at one time. I was 17 years old, and a, a good friend of mine died, and so I'm crying. And she goes, men don't cry. Mm. And I kept saying uh, to her, I go, I go, <laughs> You know, it's my party. Just leave me alone. <laughs> you know, my mom was like, oh, my God. You know, you're at a funeral and you can't even cry. Jesus, help me. You know, <laughs> and so so it was just always emotional, always uh, uh, feeling things and the, the doing for others. Uh, it was just like I just constantly worked. 
even though I, it was exhausting. So that's kind of, uh, so just reading all the types, uh, two was kind of the, nailed it for me. And I, I'm just, I'm a two. Can I ask you how yeah. constantly working was related to being a two? Because I think sometimes yeah. people who work a lot get kind of labeled as threes, as if twos can't also be really hard workers. Yeah. Can you say what, what motivated you in working a lot? Well, it was... Um, um, it was as simple as uh, uh, I knew that that was my access to being with my parents. Mm -hmm. um, my my parents, there were eight of us in the mm -hmm. family. So, you know, and my mother always said, oh, this is terrible. My father had his own things, but my mom is kind of the central figure in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, she uh, used to say, love you best, and, you know, and could you vacuum, please, and, you know, could you do this, and well, the house is a mess, can you clean up, so, and my father was, you know, he was more of a seven joker, you know, so he'd always used to joke about it, but there was always this, working with him, you know, handing him tools, he was a kind of maintenance guy, so I would always help him, and uh, go out with him, and help him do work, so, like, I was kind of the worker, I mean, uh, I'm now retired, and so I looked at my Social Security, you know, and it mm. says I started working when I was like 13 years old, wow. you know, so it was like work, 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 work. And it sounds like for yeah. you, work was uh, connected to connection. Like oh, absolutely. Like at first with, with mom and dad. Absolutely. Like there was a way that working sort of gained their approval or helped you connect with absolutely. them. Absolutely. Mm. Well, actually to distinguish myself from my brothers and sisters, because mm. they were all they were all there, you know, mm -hmm. being very loud, you know, mm -hmm. and it was a very, you know, um, loud, rambunctious family. Mm -hmm. So being of helpful. Crazies. <laughs> you know, yeah. So helpful was how you distinguished yourself. Absolutely. Yeah, that's how I, okay. how I did it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Michael. Um, so Can you say a little bit I about how you discovered you were yeah. two and how you relate to the two personality type? Um... Well, I, I relate to what you said about, like, kind of as you were describing the two and sitting in, in view of all of you, I felt my, like, a vulnerability of, um, like, what's underneath the pride. Yeah. Um, and my story of how I discovered myself as a two, I think it's a, from my perspective, a good um, kind of testimonial for... Um, in my experience, the helpfulness of the Naranjo-inspired understanding of the subtypes. Um, I study the Enneagram very deeply with Russ and Don at the Enneagram Institute for many years and went through their whole training. And I always saw myself as a nine. Um, not because they told me, another coaching instructor kind of leaned that way toward me and the thing that kind of hooked me onto nine was the relationship to anger and a repression of anger. And I, I saw that about myself and then kind of like just constellated the whole nine around myself. So I, as a coach and in a way an Enneagram teacher, I, I have a lot of um, compassion for how difficult it can be to see oneself and how easy it is to identify with these types and then take them on even if it's not quite the core of what your type is. So I thought I was a nine for a long time. And then, actually, I, that's when I met you. Mm -hmm. um, Claudio Naranjo was here to do a, a, a SOT retreat four years ago. And I was going through the retreat, and he was teaching about Enneagram in the mornings, and he was teaching about the nine. And he said, who sees themselves as a nine? And I'd already been, you know, he'd already seen me in action for three or four days. And I said, I'm a nine. And he's like, no. <laughs> No, you're not a nine. <laughs> Maybe this or this or this, but not a nine. And, and, and in that moment for me, I was like inside, I was like, fuck you. <laughs> like, and, um, but it was, it, it actually launched and you really helped me through this process, um, which was very difficult because I had, um, I had studied myself so deeply through the lens of being a nine and had one of my biggest, my biggest spiritual opening during that period, which I interpreted through the lens of being a nine. So, so looking at other types was terrifying to me because it was almost as if, you know, I had, I had kind of 
I had connected the spiritual experience with the understanding through a certain mechanism of nine. I thought if I'm not a nine, then maybe that wasn't true. That would happen. Yeah. What I experienced with the me. good things you learned while you were while you were nine. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, so it was just it, so, and it was hard for me to find myself as a two. Mm -hmm. From my experience, having learned the Enneagram um, through this other school. Because I didn't see, you know, what I learned about the twos was helper, 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 mm -hmm. doing things for others all the time, really yeah. hard to say no to f to so you can do something for yourself. And I was like, screw that. I say no to a client so I can go to the spa. Like, yes. I take the last piece of chocolate cake at the table and don't even think about my kids wanting it. <laughs> yeah, like, and we're self-preservation twos, the three yeah. of us. <laughs> yeah, so I, so I, when I was looking and searching in that retreat, it was like, no, I I'm too selfish. I'm too, um, like, I, I, I was looking at three, and I see a lot of three in me as well. But I, I was really um, suspecting three. But, but I, I realized I'm, I'm, a, I'm an image type, but, but I don't get fed through accomplishing. Even though I help people with productivity, people say, oh, you must be a three. I do that because I needed help. I dropped balls all the time. I didn't finish things. Mm -hmm. And I got taught. And then I teach people what I learned. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, that that was the path toward toward two, and this you know finding the description of the self pres two, and the um, the the desire for connection, but the ambivalence about connection makes so much sense to me. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of one to one or sexual in myself too. I'm mm -hmm. probably pretty high sexual, mm -hmm. so there's um. There, there. I have a an assertiveness and a confidence and a seduction sexually sometimes that comes out, but mm -hmm. um, but I identify. I see in myself the. I mean, I don't know so much about the two. Yeah, well, I, I think a couple of things about when we met and and my sense of you also was. Um, I wondered if you were an image type when I met you, you know, and that was the retreat at which you changed from a nine to a two. And by the way, I give you a lot of credit for. Because it's hard to relate to one type for a while and then totally reassess. And I give you a lot of credit for the way you did that. And my, but my sense of you when I met you is almost something that felt like me, and that and, and almost an awareness of how people are, are feeling about you. Oh my God! Yes, I, thank you for saying that. <laughs> yes. I was going to say that because yeah. as I was sitting yeah. back there imagining myself up here, I was yes. feeling the fear of wait, maybe they're going to see something. Maybe they're going to see that I'm not a two and I don't even know that I'm not a two. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. And, yes. and that's, that's, that, I see that in my life a lot where, and in my spiritual work where I, I may be sitting with my spiritual teacher doing a deep in inquiry and I may have an instance of, wait, what do you see? Because only if you see it yes. is my experience valid. Yes. Or do I exist yes. in this state that I'm existing? So you're touching on a few really important things about two. One is because we're shapeshifters, because part of our survival strategy is I'm going to be who you want me to be so we can connect. And so I can feel connected to you and maybe get some of my needs met through you. But definitely there's a way that like I am whoever you want me to be. Uh, and so to sort of shift their presentation depending on who they're with as a way to make that rapport. So as a result, we, we, when we start working on ourselves and even after that, we can almost have a sense of like, well, who are we really? Yeah, yeah. There's a sense yeah. of twos of not really having a clear sense of self because if I can change myself to be with, connected to you and then I can change myself again by accentuating certain parts of myself and de-emphasizing other parts of myself to be connected to you and then again differently from you to you, then who am I if I can shift and yeah. change like that? One last thing I'll mention yeah. on that note, just a great example of that in my life. Yeah. At another retreat where we were doing some movement, some spontaneous dance movement, the instruction was um, experiment with you know moving and dancing first from intention, like I want to move like this, and then take some time to experience just spontaneous movement, just... Mm -hmm. And in that spontaneous movement place, I, I had this incredibly difficult experience of, of feeling completely imprisoned by no matter how much I thought I was spontaneously moving, I was imprisoned by, the, even with my eyes yeah. closed, 
the uh, the imagined eyes of others on me yes. that I could, it felt like this impossibility of moving spontaneously yes. just from spontaneity. Beautiful. And it just it dropped me into this incredible shame and exactly. sadness. And, exactly. And I still dance, and you know that's a big source of practice for, for freedom, like playing yes. with edges of freedom. It's almost like we can't be on our own because we're so sensitized to how others experience us or how we want others to experience us. Sometimes what I say is, as a two, there's a huge difference between being completely alone in a room and one other person being there, even if I don't know them at all. Like once someone else comes into the picture, it's almost like we can't be in our own experience because we we go out, our awareness goes out to, what do you think of me? How do you feel about me? And I like how you even started, both of you even started with a little bit of vulnerability. In other words, it's kind of vulnerable to be up here with so many people because there's this worry, this ongoing worry of what will they think of me? Will they like me? What, how do they see me? And I think this also points to a key need that twos have, and to some degree all three heart types have, in terms of being mirrored. And in psychological language, it's a key need of all people, but especially heart types, to be mirrored by others. In other words, we look to others to sort of have a positive sense of who we are and how, and to even know who we are. Uh, and mirroring is, you know, when a child, for instance, like is does does something like swings on the swing and says, mommy, look at me, look at me. They're asking for mirroring. They're asking for validation and affirmation for doing what they do. And that's the way self-esteem is built. Uh, and for the heart types, often there was a deficit in mirroring. In other words, they didn't have a clear reflection of a parent saying, this is who you are, you. Not based on anything I want you to be or any feelings I have about you or anything society says you should be, but just you. And sometimes it's only through relationship that we even discover who we are. Um, but I think so much of what you said, Michael, really directly applies to these really key important things about how we almost exist in relationship and we learn who we are or we, or we learn to feel okay or not okay based on how other people feel about us. Yeah. I think all types share that, but twos are just... Like, twos are the most, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to some degree, yeah. Although some will say not so much, yeah. <laughs> Kathy, thank you. How, how did you discover you a two, you're a two and how, what is this, what, what do you, how do you see the two patterns showing up for you in, mm -hmm. in your life? Well... <clears throat> I went to, about 25 years ago, went to a workshop weekend, a whole weekend of, like this is, only it was a whole weekend, all nine panels in a weekend, um, down in the Santa Cruz Mountains, Ben Loman. And I knew from the minute the panel started talking that they were under my skin. They were as if they were in my body. <clears throat> Okay, here come this is the vulnerable part and for someone to know me that well. Just that that that's a vulnerable place to be for someone to know me that well. But and yet it was very exciting at the same time mm -hmm. for me to understand that I was learning about a starting place for myself. Mm -hmm. We desperately want to, to be work. seen, but we often don't feel seen. Yeah, so yeah. there's that push pull, there's all those things that operate in us, in me, I should say, <clears throat> around that. Um, so I knew immediately I was two. There was never any question. I didn't know about the subtypes then. I wasn't real clear on the wings, all that, but I knew, I knew without a doubt I'm a two. I, I grew up in a family of, of, I was the oldest of five kids. My dad was alcoholic and therefore not really that available. My mom was real involved with him, therefore not that available, and I learned how to take care of everyone else. I learned how to take care of my siblings. I learned how to take care of the neighborhood. I, I mean, my life became about connection um, with people outside myself. Um, the more I could do, I, be, I really did become a human doing. No question about it. I mean, I wasn't a workaholic, but... <clears throat> I, I, I'll just share one little example um, where this came to light recently. A friend of mine passed, passed away from colon cancer. She was a workmate. And uh, I was, I was uh, visiting her. She was in hospice at home. And I, you know, I, was, I, was visit, I had retired from my job, a nurse practitioner. So I went into the medical field and be, you know, just carried it out. Um, 
And because of all that training as a two giver child, a helper, t- caretaker, I was really good at it. I mean, I was really good at what I did because I had all this training. Now, with that said, so I was with this, this really dear friend of mine. And she was dying way before we all thought she should. She was, you know, younger, much younger than I am. And <clears throat> one day she she progressed from being on the couch when I got there to being in a chair to being in a, from clothes to being in a robe. And then one day I got there and she was in bed and um, I was just sitting there and I just looked at her and I, you know, I was, we were just talking and I, I, I looked at her and I said, Sonia, is there anything that I can do for you? Mm-hmm. I mean, this, this was a critical moment for me. She said, you're doing it. Mm. You don't need to do anything. There was nothing I could do to help her. Just being you and being there. Just being there, mm. holding her hand was... So I went, oh my God. That, that was like an amazing lesson for me. Mm. I've never forgotten it. It has powered my work since then. And today I'm, I'm all about learning how to love me mm-hmm. because, you know, all of this doing, all of this doing for others is really an effort to get someone to love me, Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, accept me, see me, hear me, but love me. Mm-hmm. And I know how to love people really well. And, you know, like when you, you, you said that, that, um, giving to get there was a long period in my life and still still it still can get into operation where i just want my needs to be met and i don't know how to ask for them yeah so so um yeah so i was a two from the get-go yeah that's really really clear yeah and you're right so much of the path of the two naranjo says that twos uh suffer the most of any type from the lack of love, like a love need. Yeah. You know, the sense of I didn't get enough love and it's like the means of getting the love is by doing things for other people or supporting yeah. or getting really active, Yeah, right? And doing and or performing or proving ourselves. Although again, it's exhausting and oftentimes we don't want to and it, it hurts inside that we have to do that because yeah. we feel it's, it's coming from a place of, I'm not enough just sitting here being me. And so that's a beautiful, poignant story where you learn actually just being who you are, just being there, you don't have to do anything, Mm -hmm. is a loving act. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that you're right, the path is about learning to love ourselves so that we slowly realize that we don't have to do anything to get the love. We we just are worthy of love, Mm -hmm. just being ourselves. I want to say one more quick thing, if I could, about grief and loss, because that's always been something where... Gosh, grief? I, I, what am I grieving from? You know what? You know, in, in in the beginning when I first heard that, it was a real stopper for me. I thought, but you know what? As, as I've continued to work with this, I, I when I, it is very lonely, um, taking care of other people all the time if the motivation is not right. Mm-hmm. And I have experienced that loneliness. Um, in other words, I said to my siblings one time, a long time ago, my youngest sibling was lost her husband to a brain tumor. And we were all driving back from scattering ashes, I think, and I said to them all, I'm the main caretaker. I mean, I was the big caretaker for them. I said to them, it's really lonely being the oldest. Mm-hmm. You know, this, this, is, this is another, just a manifestation of two. And what, what I create for myself, being a two, is that I'm so busy taking care of everyone else, I don't know who I am, and people get used to being taken care of, and right. they don't look toward me. Right. So it can be a real trap. Yes. And I can be left feeling extremely um, alone and sort of isolated from what I crave, right. which is true connection with, a, with another human being. Right. So anyway, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, and maybe I might just mention, although we can talk about the subtypes more as we go on, that Kathy's a social too. So a little bit different than Michael and Randy and I. Uh, And I think a little bit more in that, um, almost in a leader position and you being the oldest. And so I think think you're right that there is a loneliness to, to where we... 
try to do so much, but we kind of separate ourselves out from what we really want, which is connection by trying to do it and not always being knowing how to receive what we need. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that there's even an added thing to that, I think, for social twos who can sort of be the leader or the power or kind of set themselves apart by being almost more powerful than other people, like, and and having even a harder time showing vulnerability around expressing what you need from from us. Um, there's so one thing I need right now. And that's a Kleenex. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Well done. Well done. That's progress. Here. That's growth in action. <laughs> growth in action. Because let me tell you, there probably were previous years where you wouldn't have even asked no, for it. I'm sitting here yes. like, oh, should I just sit Same. here and get through this dribbling <laughs> note? <laughs> so that, safer place that's health. Away. That's health. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Kathy. Great, Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so Jerry, can you tell us a little bit about how you recognized you're a, you're a two and how that plays out in your life? Uh, well, I'll start by saying that it's been somewhat interesting, this whole process of being part of the panel. Um, I've done so much work and healing around being a two that I almost was questioning whether or not I was still a two. <laughs> And Which, then I sat here and within 10 minutes, I'm like, yeah, I'm a two. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and that the story that you told, Mike, was really profound um, about the dance. Mm -hmm. And damn it, I said I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, about being so focused on what everyone else is feeling and thinking about me that, there, that I've also found it difficult to be spontaneous and be in my own presence and be in my own space and claim that space for mm -hmm. myself. Um, so thank, thank you mm -hmm. <laughs> for validating I'm still too. Mm -hmm. um, I'm definitely the poster child for the um, subtype one-on-one. Um, -on -one. Um, I created an entire um, life and identity and purpose around relationships and making sure that I attracted as many needy men as possible into my life so <laughs> that I could step up and be the crutch and be the backbone and be the foundation for these people um, so they wouldn't leave me. Mm -hmm. You know, I needed to create sort of a, um, a dependence for them to need whatever I had to offer and I offered a lot. I was into country music, I was into rock and roll music, I was into rap music, I was into painting, I was into rock climbing, I was into like shapeshift everything yes. about who I was. Yes. Um, and I thought for sure these were like guaranteed things that I could do in order to sustain the love that these men were giving me and, and also ensure that they never would go away. <laughs> and um, after a a few really devastating heartbreaks, I started to question, like, what the hell? I'm a nice person. I give and give and give and give. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to have sex with me anymore. Nobody is mm -hmm. here. They're all turning their backs on me. And as soon as they get on their feet, they're gone. Yeah. And so I really had to take a good look at myself. And it's interesting, the evolution of my tunis and my healing I'm sitting here more nervous than I've ever been and more vulnerable than I've ever been on this panel mm -hmm. because I'm now facing the shame of all of it. Right, right. And it, I think for twos, it's even more humiliation. It's so humiliating. Because it's related to humility, which is the higher virtue, which is the opposite of pride. But I love what you're saying, Jerry, because I think there's something, you're really pointing out the pride in a beautiful way. Oh, and Because yeah. I had that same exact experience. It's like, why would anyone ever not like me? Mm -hmm. Why would anyone ever leave me? Like, I'll give them anything. I'll do anything. Anything. I'll, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm fun at a party. I'm fun yeah. to be around. I'm yeah. generous. I'm, you know, I'll do all these things for you. Right. I, I like sports. You know, men like sports. Uh -huh. I like all the sports, right? <laughs> 
you know, my, I, I'll watch football with you and I'll be happy about it, not complain, you know? Right. So there's all this, you know, and so, the, but the pride is like, seeing myself is all things to all people, right? right? I always had this thing of, I can make anybody and like me. Exactly. <laughs> you know, but can you hear the pride? But it's so tricky oh, it because is. when you're in it, you don't, you it don't, doesn't I, seem no. like pride. It just seems like, just what? reality, yeah. you know, just and I, the factual nature of what's happening. Exactly. So I love the way you say that, the way you especially, and I think we also tend to be uh, uh, attracted to fixer-uppers. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? Because yeah. it gives us a purpose. It gives us a sense of power and being needed. And again, I, I want to really just highlight the fact that um, sometimes I, I've heard it said that twos like like needy people and yeah. I wouldn't say that no <laughs> no 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 and now you know I if I feel someone's too needy I run, run I, yeah. I don't walk I run away yeah. right because it can be a black hole because once you're sort of meeting someone's need then it's like you can't say no you've yeah. kind of implicitly promised that you're gonna do it um right. so uh, I think there's a way that it's not like we like needy people, but it's more like it, it serves this coping strategy of being of service to people, being becoming <clears throat> indispensable mm -hmm. so that they won't leave us, so yeah. that you'll love us. Uh, and so I love what you're saying because you're also getting beneath, be, beneath that and yeah. recognizing that that was the sort of prideful personality facade and mm -hmm. it hides just a deep need for love and connection yeah. that sometimes it's hard for us to get in touch with and it's also hard for us to get in touch with the humble person behind that and and and, and I love that we were saying kind of what kind of what woke you up is like wow I did all this all this stuff for you and you still left me yeah mm -hmm. I'm like what's up with that <laughs> yeah yeah and um I you know while my relationship and and I've shared this in other panels before I mean, my in thinking back on who I was attracting, I mean, these men had no jobs, no cars, no homes, no no nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, you're attractive. Come live with me. <laughs> Please give me purpose. And um, and so while my relationship now is solid, because now I'm with a six who won't even let me <laughs> be a two like that, um, which is awesome. But... Um, I'm finding it in other things now. So what I'm, where I'm finding my unhealthy tuna show up is where I am so certain you're going to love this restaurant. Can you? I'm going to take you to this place. You're going to love it. It's awesome. And then when they don't, yeah, I'm like so hurt. Yeah, I take it so yeah. personal. Like I got that so wrong. Yeah. Like what is wrong with me? Yeah. And um and it, yeah, it's like like other people are like, oh, you didn't like it? No yeah, problem. Whatever. You know, no, teach I mean, his it's own. Devastating. Yeah. But to us, it's like we thought we were doing this big thing and right. we like it. And it's like a connection that we're trying to create. And so if it mm -hmm. people that's a great example. Something like don't like something we recommend. Right. It can feel re like really painful. Really painful. Yeah. And I um the the my biggest healing, I think, which is where all this sh shame is now bubbling up from, is this profound awareness that all the giving I was giving was actually taking. Mm. And so that. In what, in what way? Can you say a little more about that? Well, I was taking the opportunity away from the people that were that have been in my life. I've been taking opportunities from them to grow, to. To make do it their, themselves. Make their own lunch. <laughs> <laughs> to learn that they can make their own yeah, lunch. Taking yeah. their choices away from them. Yes. And, you know, it was, it's just, um, I've been taking, and, and yes. also taking their, um, their own um, awareness of, of oh, what I should say, the, their own desire to stay with me. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. This might be a good moment, if you don't mind, and uh, because you're, what you're sharing is so profound, Jerry, is to mention manipulation. Oh, yeah. And that <laughs> oh, yeah. twos, I remember when I first read Helen Palmer's first book about two, and it said twos can be manipulative. That was like a big ouch, like, ooh, ow. Manipulative, that sounds really bad, and I'm so nice. How could I be <laughs> capable of such a bad thing? Um, but it's really true, and it tends to be a blind spot for twos mm -hmm. around how giving can be manipulative. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying is so 
on point because it's like I give you all this stuff, but really it's a manipulation and to get you to stay with me or to get you to like me or to get you to meet my needs that I don't want to be aware of and so don't want to have to ask for directly. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you don't give me what I need, I will get mad, you know, mm -hmm. so it's like that, even though I didn't ask. Uh, there's a great, I have to mention this while it's in my head, there's a TV show I like called Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, mm -hmm. and um, there's a, a song, it's a musical, it's a comedy and a musical, and there's a woman on there who I think is a social too, and she sings a song uh, on, in one episode that is just classic too, uh, and the name of the song is After Everything I've Done For You That You Didn't Ask For. <laughs> And she's getting mad at someone because they've done something against the plan of what she wanted them to do. Uh, and she had been doing all these things for them, you know? So it's just, I love that song because it really is. So there is this manipulation. And I think it's really important for twos to realize that they can be controlling, that they can be manipulative. And again, this is the dark side that doesn't get talked about when there's too much of a simplistic focus on, oh, twos are helpers, twos are givers. It just seems so one dimensional. And I think what's underneath that is so important for people to know is that deep down, of course, you know, it's not a malicious kind of manipulation. It's that we want to be loved and we fear that we won't be or we can't be just based on who we are. And so it's almost like we have to trick someone into doing it or like you say, just give and give and give. And so then they'll love us. But then if they start to not do what we want them to do, there can be a kind of way, subtle or not so subtle, we try to engineer them into doing what we want them to do, which is often just be with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and it can be, so it can, that can be a very important aspect that twos need to get aware of when they're on the growth path. Thank you so much, Jerry. So Deborah. It's hard getting here last. <laughs> <laughs> because? Like, uh, yeah, because I'm like, oh my gosh, I can say a lot about what everybody else has said, but what's been inter interesting for me, first of all, I knew I was a two because we went to grad school together, yeah. and you taped me for some certification you that's, were getting. That's right. Yeah. We, I did a typing interview with you yes. and we're on recording, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it was the first uh, first exposure to the Enneagram, and I looked at the two, and I went, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh. And, and before grad school, I had been an OB nurse at SF General. Mm. And when I thought about how I was that charge nurse who was just so proud that, you know, when the doctors came on on staff, oh, thank God you're in charge, mm. you know? And mm -hmm. I just had so much pride from that because it's like, yes, I can handle this. And my nurse colleagues, I'm sure, rolled their eyes because I played the martyr all the time because I could get the job done. Mm. And they're just sitting on their butts in the nursing lounge and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was just this really puffed up pride. Um, and But the other thing I, I noticed too is, uh, just how a chameleon I could be. Mm -hmm. And it would be, re I had friends from all different places, and if I got them all in the same room, I would have a panic attack. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was just like, who am I when she's here and he's here and, and that mm -hmm. other person's here? How do I show up? Yeah. So it's been a really interesting journey, and um, I think I've been really in the last few years working with the real dark side of being a two and the, the manipulation and the, the controlling aspects. And I, I, I don't think I've talked to you about this, but um, I did the workshop with Uranio and B last spring. And there was this moment where it was just this ultimate collapse of humiliate, humiliation. Mm -hmm. And I have never experientially understood humiliation like that. And, and the funny aspect is we were at um, the Petaluma retreat place and there was a men's group going on at the same time. And I'm a sexual too. And Uranio said, I want you to come in next tomorrow with no makeup on, take the scarf off and mess your hair up. And, and I, I did it. And then I'm like in the cafeteria with this hunky men's group. And I'm going, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> and it was just like, oh wow, look at this. You know, it was just yeah. like uh, awareness on fire. And um, yeah. Whew, so yeah, <laughs> it, it's just amazing how the blinds, how I would go blind to that. And then just this, um, the humiliate, humility of knowing deeply, I do not have this much control. Mm -hmm. And 
I think what I was keeping from myself by really understanding that is an immense amount of grief. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't like grief. I don't do grief. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's underneath this, this pride and this needing to control for me has been to be able to tap down. And I think this is where the pure gold of the heart of the two come in. I just, I can get into so much pain about all the pain in the world Mm -hmm. and there's nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. And I don't like being in that place. Right, yes. But the more I allow myself to be in that place, Mm -hmm. the more I can feel myself opening Mm -hmm. and that is a very vulnerable place to be. And and so I'm kind of a newbie in this working with the pride Mm -hmm. and the humility and I'm I'm not really sure who I am. I feel like a baby right now. Um, coming out of this really strong stance of being this two with a three wing who can do everything and helps everybody and then has resentment and goes to eight, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, so I guess, you know, I, I, I don't know as much about the Enneagram as I'd like to, but um, I, I feel like the movement to the four of becoming much more authentic. Mm-hmm. Right. And being able to say no and, yeah. and have boundaries. And accepting your feelings, even if it's grief. Yes. As healthy fours do. Yes. Yeah, but I think I want to speak to what you're saying in terms of humiliation. Mm-hmm. Humiliation is really a path for twos mm-hmm. uh, because there's a way that what we're avoiding at all costs is rejection and even look just looking bad in front of you mm-hmm. in any way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again... It, which speaks to this kind of illusion that we have control over what you think and how you feel about us. Mm-hmm. I'll never forget, and we went to uh, graduate school together to become therapists, and I'll never forget I was in a group, uh, it was a group therapy course, and on the first day, we had to share first impressions with each other, um, and this woman, who I didn't know at all, and frankly, I, you know, I, as twos, we tend to be drawn to certain people and not drawn to other people. We're selective. We can talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but there was a way that I wasn't really that drawn to this woman, but she, we were in this group and she shared some first impressions of me. And I was like, whoa, like she sees right through me. <laughs> like what she said about me was completely true. And I thought, I, man, I have this illusion that I can just present myself in whatever way I need to, to make you think of me or see me or feel about me in a certain way. Uh, and so I think when we give that up and we're just open to whoever we are and whatever happens it's it's that letting go of control and which can feel a bit humiliating if if we're not wearing makeup or if we're caught unawares in in some particular way Mm -hmm. but it's really good for us to to be to let go of control and to show up in a way where we don't feel like we're at our best or be emotional and and again i think we're also hearing in the panel how emotional twos are um, and I'd say it's a gift that you that we have healthy twos here who are allowing themselves, uh, but we're a little bit at odds with it, right? Like Jerry said, I told myself I wasn't going to cry. It's almost like if we if we get too emotional, we're worried about what you think of us being too too emotional. Like I'll look bad if I cry. My makeup will come off. Uh, there's kind of a way that. Um, we're, we're afraid of just allowing who we are. And so sometimes twos can f- be emotional, but not be that comfortable being emotional yeah. or be in touch with a kind of sadness underneath. But we kind of were taught we had to be happy for other people. And yeah. so we can tend to be happy on the outside, um, but then there's sadness underneath. But that sadness feels a little bit threatening mm-hmm. because it's more of our real self and we're not so used to being in who we really are because we're we have more experience being uh, in that mode of being who you want me to be or it, uh, f- uh, presenting an image that we think will attract you. And the thing is, when, when I started coming out of this giver place and <clears throat> really watching that I don't have that much control, it was like, wow, I really feel selfish. And I don't think I was being selfish. My friends would say, no, you're not being selfish. You're just not up in our face anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Right, because giving all that giving can be intrusive <laughs> mm-hmm. in a way that we often don't see, or we can infantilize people by, like Jerry was saying, not letting them make their own lunch, um, and so we can not see the effects of of being too in that giving mode and not being who we really are. Uh, But you're right, the first thing that can happen on the growth path when twos realize that we have to pay more attention to our own needs is we can feel like, oh, that's selfish. 
uh, or a little bit like Michael saying, for a self pres twos, that's kind of what we wanted to do all along, but we didn't feel like we fully had permission to. Um, so it can feel like, well, if I pay attention to myself, I'm be that's there's something wrong with that, you know, and it can feel uncomfortable, <laughs> even though that's actually the path to growth for us. Yeah. yeah. So let's start again with Randy, and I want to ask you all uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what's helped you grow. Uh, what what's what what things have you worked on? It, because again, we don't want to s often spend too much time on the description, just enough so we recognize the character of the type, and so we can help people find themselves if they're twos. Right. But the main point of the enneagram is to use it for growth. So I'd love to hear some, especially sure. since we have very healthy twos here. To, how knowing you're a two has helped you uh, become more of who you really are, and 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 become more self-aware. Um, uh, <laughs> I have a coach, you know, that mm -hmm. coaches me whenever I get upset, you know, and I, I've always had this belief that, um, when, if I'm upset, I'm not able to give as much. So I got to straighten myself out. So I have a coach and I just work with this coach and she's able to say, well, this is, you know. Ba 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 ba, and you just kind of sort it out. So, she and she um, helps me to um, go into how I feel. So uh, I really, you know, s uh, feelings, digging into my feelings, and then um, really understanding my feelings. And and sometimes they're just hazy. Yes. You know that my feelings are really hazy, and then but if I can particularize them and and drill into them, they're really really cool, and then the other, and making them okay. Yeah. So I want to really yeah. pause there because yeah. this is very important. I think first step on the growth path is for us to allow ourselves to feel all of what we feel, yeah. because we tend to repress. That re repression is the main defense mechanisms of, of twos. Mm. Because again, in my mind, at least in my personality mind, feelings get in the way of connection. Right. It, yeah. I, rem I remember thinking when I was in my early 20s, like uh, people don't like angry people, so I won't be angry. But delete anger. Right. And it, when I was in graduate school, right. I had a roommate who reflected back to me. She goes, you never get angry. Um, and I think she was a four, so it was a good <laughs> reflection because she was she was capable of getting angry. And I thought that can't be right. Uh, but, you know, I was 25 by this time, but I thought about it, I thought, wow, she's right. And by that time, I had not, it's like I was repressing anger because the, on some unconscious level, I feared that it would make other people reject me uh, or they wouldn't like it. And so I just won't show anger. And pretty soon you lose touch with it, sure. you know. And so I think you're absolutely right. The first step is by, and this, I think, in my early years of my own therapy, uh, a lot of it was getting in touch with my feelings because someone would ask me, what are you feeling right now when I was 24? And I'd say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I, early on, therapy was about bridge, making yeah. a bridge, like you're talking about with your coach, yeah. of like, well, could you be feeling this right now? Right. <laughs> it it seems, like, seems like you might be feeling this right now. Or I'd, I'd be talking about something and I'd start tearing up and my therapist would say, you seem touched by that. And I'd be like, oh touched by that you know it's almost like you know it's like creating a bridge to my feelings and and exactly. making us then more comfortable with our feelings exactly. and and accepting our yeah, feelings like exactly. you're saying um because it's like we sort of think there's something our feelings are going to maybe one of the things that might be cause us to be rejected right um and so we, we're again we're always monitoring ourselves for how does this look to others yes and so i really like that you're saying this because it it sounds like you've had an experience of your coach helping you see, understand, and accept your feelings by her sort of pointing them out and yeah. supporting you in knowing that they're okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly it. And um, so I have that, you know, uh, feelings, and then what is it that you want? And that's a harder thing ah, for me. So what so you want. So what do I really, really want? So I have to work on that a lot. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that really helps me a lot is, is that um, uh, um, I'm – married to a uh, sexual four and I, you know, he just nails me, you know, every time, like I made the bed for him the other day uh, because he was in the bathroom and he had things to do. So I just run behind him and made the bed and stuff like that. And he goes, Oh, I was just going to let it air out. And I, <laughs> <laughs> and I go like this, it just comes out, you know, and I go, Oh yeah. I said, I can't even make the bed right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> 
I, it, it occurred for me like yeah. I, he was being critical, you yes. know, and it's just and like. And we're very sensitive to very criticism. Very sensitive to criticism, yes. you know, and so it's Because like, we want to do it right. Right, yeah. all the time. For you. Even to, for this, and I go, I go, what's so hard about thanking you? He goes, I think you do things so that I, that you can get the currency of a thank you. So I, I started noticing that like, just, you know, he's making oatmeal for me, and he's, I thanked him four times <laughs> over like a five minute the, the period. Of course, of the oatmeal process. Of course, I want him, yeah, <laughs> and I want him to acknowledge my thank you. You yeah. know, I mean, it's, it's like nuts. It's just nuts. So, yeah. So it's, and it's, I think relationships, intimacy was a hard thing for me. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's yes. just, it's I, I got married when I was 59, you know, and it was just like, I'm not going to go this way. Mm -hmm. I, I used to be upset because I'm such a great person. I'm so wonderful. I got See money. The pride. <laughs> I, why doesn't, why don't I have a relationship? And, and so I have a relationship now and I go, oh. <laughs> I just like, I really get uncomfortable. I have no time for myself. I can't, you know, work on myself. And it's just like I'm, I'm like really uncomfortable being in this relationship. <laughs> of course, mm. you know, at four, you know, there's just like, you know, I know you're, you know, not as in love with me as I'm in, in love with you. And I'm like, how does he know that? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like... I go, you know, I have to own up to everything with this guy. It's just like, you yes. know, he's Fours happy. Are Fours are a gift. Oh. Fours are a gift oh, for us. totally. Yeah, they are so. a gift, yes, because they call us on stuff that yeah. we otherwise want to deny. Mm -hmm. And the fours in my life, therapists, clients mm -hmm. have been a gift because they, oh, yeah. they they sense what's happening and they name it. And we would we kind of want to stay blind to that some of that stuff, yeah. you know. <laughs> and so I love yeah. that you're saying this. Um, yeah. That you're that, and I love the self observation of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I also want to point out something really important that you're saying, which is um, that intimate relationships are hard for us. Yeah. Um, so, of course, what we're all about in life is relationships. Mm -hmm. And the, the closer, the better, theoretically, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> theoretically. But then when it really happens... I'm sweating just it's, talking about this. It's now. really hard for us. So it's like what we most want, we can't take in. Yeah. Um, intimacy is very hard for us because if your whole coping strategy is built around manipulating people mm -hmm. into loving you or ma making people have a certain impression of you, when they get up really, really close, you know, when you're married oh, yeah, like that, yeah. I would imagine, I don't know, but it's <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> when they get up really close, yeah. it's like you can't control so much what they see. In fact, that's the whole point of vulnerability and, and yeah. intimacy, right? Is that you're not in control, is that you surrender. Mm -hmm. And that is really hard for us. And so we can get kind of defensive in ways that we don't see when people get really close to yeah. us. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Anything okay. else you want to say about I, any of that? I think that's pretty is much that it. <laughs> That's enough for it's now. It's just like, you know, there's, the, I think for self-pres, I think, you know, uh, when Aranio, you know, I just want to pull back. You know, it's just like it's, everyone's There's a little more like, fear yeah, in the self-preservation, really, too. Yeah, it's really, really uncomfortable. A little more afraid yeah. of what you might think I'm of us. Yeah, yeah. and all this stuff. Yeah, a little more like, shy and uh, withdraw, a tendency to withdraw. Right. Yeah. That's what I want to say. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michael, so what's helped you grow and what's important for us to know about the growth path of the two? Um, yeah, reflecting on this, um, I feel like the stuff that's helped me grow has kind of, to a certain extent, I mean, I'm, I, I have a very committed spiritual uh, pro, uh, path and I've been always like a self-development junkie. So that, that, that's, that, that orientation has been there, but it feels, it feels to me like as I've just gotten older and matured, the stuff has just come forth that has been maturing. It's not like I went and said, I'm going to go act like a four or right. I'm going to go do this or I'm going to right. manipulate myself. But I, but what I've seen is, um, you know, a whole period of time, actually after that, that profound spiritual opening that I had, um, where the psychological material, the early stuff just came, like opened up, mm -hmm. like all this childhood wound stuff. Became more, you became more aware of that. Which, which then fueled it's almost like I, I became very four-ish, mm -hmm. um, very emotional, very whipping myself into the emotions, 
like for the sake of trying to get to spiritual connection, mm-hmm. actually, it was my kind of thing. So that's like the false will of the tool too, thinking he can create love mm-hmm. by doing something, mm-hmm. but through like a, a weirdness of, of uh, over emotionality. Um, but other things that have, that have come up and helped me grow, definitely relationship. And I was in a relationship with a sexual four as well. And there was a huge gift in that in terms of how she did help me see so much. Um, and it was also a lot of suffering, a lot of difficulty. Oh, sure. And there was a whole year that I, as I was getting in touch with this hurt, worthless feeling child, that I almost probably five times a week would do a gestalt with my inner child. Mm-hmm. And... Um, learn about him and hold him and teach him and um and that shifted a lot for me um kind of reintegrating that and not having him run me so much right and i think it's especially important for us self pres twos because there's a way that um as self pres twos we get caught a little bit in that child that didn't get enough love mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and, very over identified with him as an old pattern, yeah. Right, right. And, and and almost you can feel a lot of what feel like kind of young feelings around not getting the love that you need, um, fear of rejection, or um, sometimes when I get mad, it's a little bit like pouty or a little, you know, there's a little bit of a tantrum or there's a sense that I can't do things for myself. And so part of the seduction is I can't do it. You have to do it for me, you know, and it's like wanting people to come take care of you because that young child didn't get the care that it needed. And so sometimes that can drive the show unconsciously that those unmet needs and that child that didn't get the love. And so you're coming from that place. So I love what you're talking about because in the, the basis of what we need to do for ourselves is learn to hold that child ourselves, Mm -hmm. you know, because as long as we're looking for others to do it for us, um, we're not doing the inside job that we need to do. So I love that Mm -hmm. what you're saying is for a long period of time, really getting more comfortable with that child inside that didn't get the love he needed. Yeah. And just uh, one other thing to share that's a subtlety about that inner child stuff in me (laughs) is there was a moment when I was um, doing some work in it with a a guy who does kind of drama therapy in a group. And uh, after all this inner child work, I had this moment in this visualization with my inner child where I, where this guy who was leading this thing said something about, feel the generosity of your child. Mm. Which to me was like, wait, I'm the only one that's generous to him. But when I felt this loving accepting generosity of this young part of myself that it was like this loop of uh, everything changing where it's, I saw my own assumption that I need to do everything for that part, Yeah. but I can actually receive yes. from him too. Yes. Well. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of a big shift for me happened where there's a teacher, Anthony DeMello, some of you may have heard of, and he has this teaching about how there is one need, one human need, and that is to love, right? So it kind of turned it around for me because I think from a two place, you're coming from like, I'm trying to get the love, you know, but to realize there's just one need and that is to love, you know, and that it, it was sort of like turned it around for me. So I love that you're saying there's a generosity of lovingness that comes from your inner child that's also not about that child doing anything, just being. Yeah, exactly. Him. It was just being, right? Yes. Yeah, this sense of being. Last thing I'll say yeah. is just, just like with everything in the Enneagram, the path to growth is self-observation, period. Yeah. Um, and um, and I feel very grateful. I'm in, uh, in a spiritual group called the Diamond Approach or Diamond Heart, and it's very, very aligned with this kind of work. And um, I just keep on look, just keep on observing and inquiring what's here, what's, and the Enneagram is one kind of map that, that can come up as a reference point. Um, can I ask you one more thing? Cause I think you're pointing to relationships as a really, really key area for our growth. Um, 
What do you think is the one one of the most important things that you've been able to self observe happening for yeah, you in relationships? Yeah, I was just getting in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So in, in the diamond approach, we have this practice called clearing. It's probably not unlike you know in the diamond approach as well. Yeah. So we're doing all these clearings where we're si- we're sitting with another individual, not necessarily if there's something been wrong between us, but just what's here between us. What am I noticing in myself that maybe having me be not clearly and fully being able to just be with you. You might clear up an argument or something like that, or, and it's all about owning whatever our object relation patterns or projections are. And what I've seen in that, clear, you know, and we're clearing with everybody in our large group, like 100 people, this pattern of probably 90% of the time as I'm sitting and, and looking at what's here, what's here right now with you, it's, it's actually feel, seeing my sense of superiority and and copping to it the pride and yeah it, although it, i call it superiority because it feels like I, you know the way it comes out is mm. i have to this is in, this feels humiliating to say but i'm noticing myself feeling like a one up from you and a judgment mm. that i'm better than you in some way mm. and it's very familiar and and then just being with that person and looking in their eye and having them be with me mm. and feeling the burning of that and feeling the 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 truth come through. Yeah, I was going to say the scary truth. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. yeah. But 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 then you know then I feel then I can there's this sense of what I've lately called a healthy brokenness that I mm. I am in touch I, mm. I arrive at and beautiful. All of a sudden, like my body feels right sized, <laughs> and I feel vulnerable but real. You know, so that's an example. That's a beautiful example. And for me, it's it's like a similar thing, not exactly the same, but similar is just learning to give and receive feedback. Like that was always a really scary process for me because I really want to know what you think of me, but what if you think something negative? What if I'm not doing something right? You know, but just being open to that is all about humility, you know, and being able to be honest. I think sometimes we aren't always honest about what we really think and feel because, again, we're afraid of hurting the other person. We over-empathize with people, and then we feel like they can't take it. They can't take our truth, you know, that maybe you're feeling something that isn't, that's a judgment or something. But trusting people and trusting that, that truth is the best way to go. Thank you. Kathy, so what, what's helped you grow? Well, let's see. Um, I think this, uh, this one thing that you just said about self-observation, um, I, um, I love this work, and I'm involved in a spiritual practice every morning where I ask myself, what do I need? How do I, how am I feeling? Because, and, 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 um, please direct me to be right size today. Please direct me to be just one of many. Help me know that I don't know all the answers. I mean, I have this little litany of stuff. And help me know that I can't control people, places, or things, that this mm. stuff happens and, um, and I don't have the solution. All of that behavior put me in a position of feeling superior. Or like I had the answer and I knew what you needed mm-hmm. or I knew what to do for you or I knew how to help you, mm-hmm. but um, you probably didn't. And, yes. you know, I mean, it just, and then I had a friend tell me one time, she was kind of a personal coach to me. She said, do you realize that all of your giving, now this was maybe an exaggeration, but, you know, I took it as 100%. All of your giving is self-serving. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All of your helping is self-serving. I mean, until you know the difference, that's true. Mm-hmm. And that was that was such a shock for me. But I those the, these these are pivotal pivotal um, sort of auditory learnings that I've had and that continue to um, guide my actions. <clears throat> the other thing that's really helped me is to learn that. What another person thinks or feels about me is none of my business. Mm, yes, it's a good one. <clears throat> There's another thing. I mean, I love these little uh, these little visual m- metaphors. Um, if if I were to stand up and um, like this, like this, and twirl around like this, 
Anything inside that circle is my business, and anything outside that circle is none of my business. If, if, you, if we're in a relationship and you're here, you're my business. But you're not my business. <laughs> and you're not my, you know what I mean? It's like it's helped me so much no, draw a boundary on myself. Boundaries. Like what I, have, what I have to be concerned about and what I don't. Mm-hmm. And I then then I get to sit with the uh, I get to sit with the feel the discomfort of of being in that space. The other thing that's coming up for me right now that I'm I'm just telling you that as I mean this is like this search continues and then pretty soon these little kernels emerge and and it is that the feeling that um, the, another touch into the feeling that I am unlovable. And it is in it is in the process of doing a spirit a, 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 a personal search for a connection with for a spiritual connection that I, I I question can sort of the God of my understanding my divine inner self can can I can I really be loved mm-hmm. is the question. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I know that there's a real strong conditioning element with my little kid Mm -hmm. inside me about that. And I've made an appointment with a therapist to go and plumb that. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. in any case, you know, there is that. So it is asking those questions. Mm -hmm. What do I need? What do I want? Mm -hmm. How am I feeling? How am I feeling? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I never knew. I didn't have a relationship with me. Mm -hmm. So then this, you know... You said something earlier about the one thing is to love. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I have a very big capacity to love. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, that capacity to love myself is not as great as it is to love others. Mm-hmm. So I really feel that's my growing edge right now is to learn how do I re- truly love me naked and dripping wet? Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of unadorned mm-hmm. in in all my feelings, in all my senses of where I stand, my hierarchy of where I stand, my, in my pride. How do I love me and have compassion for me right where I am? That, and I, I, I truly believe that's the only thing that's going to allow me to move forward. Mm-hmm. So that's my work right now today. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I like it when yeah. they say you can't really love someone else until you love yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, even though I think you're right, we're very loving. It's we see the positive in others very easily. We see the good stuff, um, and you're saying so many important things. I think sort of even having as a mantra. I used to have as a mantra, "What do I need today? What do I need today? What do I need right now? What do I need right now?" And for a while, I didn't get answers, but eventually, and even if it's simple things, mm-hmm. I also want to highlight something you said about certain things not being any of your business. I think it's a lot about boundaries. And as twos, we merge with other people emotionally. Um, twos and all heart types have, heart. the heart has a function. It's almost like it goes out there and it kind of figures out how you're feeling right now. You know, I can sort of sense, the heart can kind of sense, you know, that's why it said that heart types can read a room. You know, we know who's open to us and, you know, oh, you're feeling a little bit sad, so maybe I'll go connect with you in a certain way. Um, but I, so I think that's a gift that we have. And at the same time, I think there's a way that we can unconsciously over, uh, get enmeshed with people. Mm -hmm. Uh, where we want to have a helping function, but we get too emotionally involved. And we don't know where we stop and the other person begins. And so I think twos are one of the types, um, probably along with nines, that most need to learn about boundaries and to learn that I shouldn't get offended if you don't take my advice, you know, that I don't know everything that that, that is good for you, even though there was a point where I, exactly like you said, I believed I did. Um, So, and even like what you think about me is none of my business. I I think that's almost, and the beauty of it is if twos can kind of get over the 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 difficulty of that as being having one of our coping strategy be, being taken away it's actually a relief mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know it's a totally. relief like oh, i don't have to take care i don't have to worry mm-hmm. about you i don't have to worry about what you think of me right. um if we can get there it actually takes a lot of the pressure off and mm-hmm. we can feel more free and feeling free is kind of one of the holy ideas of uh of 
twos, and it's actually something that we end up craving because when we're so connected to other people and we so we we, we create these dependencies, it, we can sort of have a thirst for freedom. You know, what, what, I just want to say one quick thing yes. on that freedom thing. Um, what, what the thing that I'm learning and and is in, you know, showing up for my wrongdoings or my you know, my snarky attitude or whatever I might get, if I can apologize for that, like right away, mm -hmm. I get freedom on the other side. Yeah. Like you were talking about clearing. I don't, I'm not quite sure what that system is, but this idea of if I can own myself and be honest about where I sit and what I stand in right now, then, then that's, that's where I can get freedom. But I have this whole system of hiding all that and and with the, carrying the illusion that what you think is going to determine my okayness, mm -hmm. um, that cuts me off from the honesty that yeah. is the only thing that's going to give me freedom. Mm -hmm. If I can just be honest and state it and be out and out myself with it, mm -hmm. then there's then I you know you can't argue with the truth. Mm -hmm. It's like oh then I can just let my shoulders drop. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I think sometimes we choose we sugarcoat things. We don't always tell the truth because I used to think like not telling the truth it's like social lubrication. Mm -hmm. It just makes things go easier, you know, if you don't know every little thing, you know. Um, but I think when we can get really honest, that's something that really helps us. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Jerry, how, what's helped you grow? Uh, um, well, I was introduced to the Enneagram about five years ago when I met my beloved. And um, I think just knowing that the nature of two is to give with an agenda and just understanding that really, really answered that question that I always cared, that I had with me of why did they leave? <laughs> and, and it was really important that that question get answered because I was perpetuating the pattern of finding the same type of guy, the same type of situation so that I could not face the answer. And so knowing the answer has provided a lot of healing for me. And I think being in a relationship where um, my giving can actually be seen as offensive and it's, and he's not afraid to let me know that it's <laughs> offensive. <laughs> um, it really, really created a lot of space for me. And so I, mm. I do things like I made a deal with myself that I would ask questions. I would ask first. So if I'm in the, kitchen making lunch for myself <laughs> and I feel the burning desire to make lunch for my partner <laughs> I will ask him would you like to have lunch yes. would you like me to make lunch and so I've given myself these little exercises to help me so that my compulsion it can be minimized and sort of regulated and um yeah, and I want to just say so one, one thing to that is it also <clears throat> requires, and what I'm hearing you say is something I relate to a lot, it also requires us becoming a little bit less sensitive, Yes. right? Yes. So if someone can say, you know what, what you're giving me right now isn't really what mm -hmm. I need or want, it's like, <gasps> like when you're first, when you're a two <laughs> first working on this, it feels like, oh my God, I'm doing it wrong. Like everything about me is wrong. Right. You know, we take it, it's, it's, we're very sensitive to hearing anything negative. Okay. And so I think there's a way that we, we, uh, my first therapist once said to me, I think you need to grow a thicker skin. Yeah. And when she said it, it hurt because I was sensitive to that. Um, <laughs> like, ouch, that feels like criticism, right? But at the same time, thank, thank God, I knew she was right. right. I knew that it's like, it's like I'm too, like everything that, the, everything uh, that you say to me that isn't like, oh my God, you're amazing, mm -hmm. can potentially hurt me, you know? Well, and, 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 <laughs> And, and that's part of that's yes. part of the the sort of shame because it's like here I am with this heart of wanting to give mm -hmm. to my partners wanting to, to my to you. wanting to please but I never asked yeah. what it was I could do or if I was if right I, in guessing exa you know? exactly yeah. like it didn't matter and so now I'm kind of negotiating that for myself <laughs> and as I'm coming through this healing part well. Being in a relationship where my tunis doesn't work anymore, my unhealthy tunis has goodness. freed yeah. me up, and yeah. I have all this time. <laughs> and so, <laughs> to spend on yourself, <laughs> I have all this time. Uh, and and I um, I just turned fifty, so I'm in my second act, and so I've realized 
how much of my life I need to get my shit together in, yeah. right? And so I've spent, so my focus right now is so much on on recuperating my my losses and 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 doing for me i'm finding myself going to the kitchen getting up from you know watching a movie with with ed and going to the kitchen getting water and coming back and sitting down and him looking at me like well aren't you gonna get me a glass of water too? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> get it yourself now, now i'm all the way on the other side <laughs> so there you go hey. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, Deborah, what else? What, what's, what have you done that's helped you grow? Kind of what have I not done? <laughs> um, I've been a personal growth junkie since I was 25. You know, I've been in therapy and workshops and Enneagram this and spirituality that. And um, I have definitely um, prided myself in that. <laughs> Um, I think right now what, you know, I've done a lot of inner work, I've done a lot of observation, and the thing that's helped me the most in the last few years is actually getting in touch with um, conflict and being able to have anger Mm -hmm. at people. And not from an eight place, but from a real grounded place of that's not okay. Mm -hmm. And then I think I'm going to disintegrate, you know, or they're going to disintegrate. Mm -hmm. And I I have a good friend who's a counterphobic six. And one of the the most growth um, periods I had is we got really angry at each other. Mm. And she's yelling at me and I'm yelling at her. And and within five minutes, we were hugging each other and crying. Mm -hmm. And I was like oh my God, I felt so alive. Mm -hmm. It was the most alive I've ever felt. And, you know, so it was just like, oh, you know, sometimes I can't put it into words. I can't articulate it, but it's a feeling I get that I'm sitting on this aliveness that is being covered by this kind of facade of being this giver, this nice person, Mm -hmm. and how to integrate all the feelings that I have. And be just truly authentic, just mm-hmm. truly just be, this is who I am, this is what I'm feeling. And then I brace myself, is that okay? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I'm getting more comfortable with being the, un- with the uncomfortableness. Yes. And I think that's been my biggest growth uh, push right now is how to get uncomfortable with the uncomfortableness. Yes. And not turn to food or distraction or, right. you know, then going into being sugary nice and, oh, I didn't mean it or, right. you know, all that kind of stuff. And then just kind of being still. It, it's kind of interesting. I feel a little more five-ish. You know, I'm looking. Mm-hmm. It's like I like my solitude. I like my down, my meditation time. I, being alone is really good for twos. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I relate to the relationship part. I didn't get married until I was 54. And I, because I kept being in relationships with narcissists who I got to give a lot to and didn't have to show up. And now I'm with this really loving, generous person. He's a, I thought he was a nine when I married him, but I found out he's a one. (laughs) (laughs) He's surprise, surprise. And, um, but he's a very generous person. And, um, it's just really interesting to feel like I'm the selfish one in the relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm kind of learning to swim in that. Mm, nice. <laughs> it's like, okay, am I the selfish one? You know, it's nice. a really different feeling. Yes, yes. Um, so several things you're saying are really important. I think getting in touch with anger and expressing it. One time when I was doing some group work, the leader of the group, the teacher of, of that we're teaching us how to do this certain form of group process, said he, uh, he thought I needed to get in touch with my inner bitch, you know, which was really true. It's, it's like we're out of balance because we can't bring forth what we're upset about because we think it will lead to rejection. Um, a little bit like nines, we can be a little conflict avoidant, you know, so learning that actually we can become closer to people the more we express real feelings, even if it's anger, and allow ourselves to have conflict. If we weather that conflict, we've both expressed more of who we really are, and we've allowed for more real closeness, as opposed to the fake closeness that happens when we're being more fake nice or something like that. Yeah. 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 I actually yeah. I don't know if it's appropriate to ask you this right now, but. Um, that's sort of where I'm at right now is kind of questioning if I'm really in touch with the fact that I have a raging inner bitch inside me. Yay! Like, <laughs> because of all this stuff that I had to endure growing up, 
um, I have a lot of anger, but I, but there's a part of me that says, look, you're not going to survive being a bitch. Just be nice. Yes. And so That's does the, the tuness, is that where that yes. comes from? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we, we, we think we have, again, we have to be nice. We have to orient ourselves a certain way so that other people will be like us, which means we end up being false and inauthentic. You know, even though I think twos value authenticity, sometimes we aren't because again, out of a fear that we won't be loved or accepted if we are in our real feelings. So I think it's liberating for twos to get in touch with their anger, the part of them that doesn't like what's going on um, so that we can just first of all, be more real, and second of all, learn that true intimacy comes from being honest and allowing all the all our feelings to be there and not just the nice ones, not just the happy ones. But I think what happens with us sometimes is because we've, we've sort of trained the people around us to just expect the niceness. When we get angry, it can feel like it's, some, it's this big earthquake. One time I just, when I was first in therapy and getting in touch with my grief and sadness, um, I went to work one day and I wasn't happy and I noticed people were, kept going, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's, what's wrong? You know, because they sensed I wasn't like ah, list, lifting everyone up. And it was, re it was a huge eye opener for me. Like, it's not okay for me just to be where I am. And so I think that's part of the discomfort you're talking about, Deborah, is like getting more comfortable with these uncomfortable emotional spaces because that, that are outside of our control or outside of being nice or outside of just being this kind of supporter or pleaser, uh, but that are really more real. And that's the path of liberation to be more who we really are and authentic and then find out what our sense of self is and come from there instead of the person being more the person that needs to um, turn themselves into in a shapeshifter way who we think we need to be to get love which that person by the way can't isn't available to receive love. Um, it's only when we allow ourselves to get beyond that personality facade that we're even we're, there's somebody at home to receive what we would like to, what we want most want anyway, which is real love and, and acceptance. Yeah. Okay. So let's leave it there for a moment, and we'll open it up to questions in a moment. But Michael, I wanted to see if there's anything that you would like to share before we open it up to questions. Well, first of all, it's a wonderful panel. I just want to thank all the panelists for, you know, great, great contributions. B, could you say a little bit about the uh, arrows uh, to uh, eight and four? And also... Um, uh, remind us that your uh, teaching is distinctive in how you see the arrows. Sure. So uh, both the specific question of the arrows to eight and four, what they mean for the two, that, that's and then what is truly distinctive about your approach to the arrows in general. Sure. So um, we believe, so every type is connected by arrow lines to two other points. We believe there's, a, these are, and when I say we, my teaching partner and I who develop a lot of our theory and work together, um, we believe that those are really great growth opportunities and balancing points um, for all the types. Um, we believe that you need to integrate higher aspects of those types in order to really grow, that those are excellent growth paths. Now, we also can slide to either one of those points unconsciously, and we usually slide um, in an unconscious way to the lower aspects of those types. Uh, so two is connected to four and eight. Um, and another thing that's distinctive to our approach is uh, it's, I, I think it's important to go against the arrow first and then with the arrow. So it's a little bit like going back in time and then going, coming back to the present and then going ahead to the future. Um, so two is connected to four. Uh, when we go back against the arrow, four is what we might has been called the security point. We could also call it the heart point. In my book, I call it the sort of the child heart point because it's a little bit like getting in touch with what wasn't really, there wasn't really space for in childhood in one way or another for two. And often twos will report that it, it wasn't, their real feelings weren't really encouraged in childhood, especially darker right. feelings, feelings that might be a burden to our caretakers like sadness or pain or anger. And so we kind of learn to get those out of the ways and just be happy for other people, uh, you know, to, uh, to be pleasant with other people. Uh, but at four, in a healthy way, when we go there intentionally and consciously, we integrate 
uh, the things that, that healthy fours do, like accept all feelings, um, be more in right. their emotional experience and not apologize for it. Um, see the value in all emotional experiences, have a wide, have access to more easy access to a wider range of feelings and value the authentic expression of those feelings. This is, these are all things healthy and fours do. And be the center of own attention, yes. And so another piece of it is two's attention goes outside themselves. Fours are self-referencing, others twos are other referencing. So in other words, instead of having our attention all out there on how you're feeling and not at a certain point, not really even knowing what we're feeling or what we need, um, tuning into taking the attention back and going on the inside like for healthy fours do and being able to balance the focus on the outside with the focus on the inside. What am I feeling right now? What do I need right now? What do I want? in my life and how can I make that a priority not more important than everybody else but as important as what everybody else needs so I can put that in the picture um, those are things that we do when we go to four when eight when two now we believe that we go against the arrow first because if we integrate the qualities of that type against the arrow um, then it creates a stronger sense of self and an inner foundation to make the trip to the point with the arrow uh, which is a, a more challenging point it's sometimes called the stress point it does raise our defenses more uh, it's a more challenging point but uh, we also believe that it's the path of spiritual growth and that spiritual growth or psychological growth is by definition stressful and we do need to encounter our challenges so at when twos go to eight in a healthy way they become more direct uh, they get more in touch with anger and channel it in healthy ways to make boundaries and say what they need and express what they want uh, they learn to have conflict with less fear and, and, and uh, nervousness. They recognize that conflict is actually a good thing um, and that if you do it in a good way, it brings you closer to people. It helps you get what you want. Um, and, and they also, twos also step into their power and authority more at eight. Um, two, eights yeah. often feel an easy sense of strength and power when, when they're at their best. And, uh, it helps us feel our strength more and step into our power. Um, some of us can either make ourselves bigger than we actually are in pride or smaller than we actually are. Um, especially self-preservation twos, but all the twos and that sort of a reaction to being too big. Oh no, no, don't mind me. Um, I don't need anything. Um, and so it's, it's about recognizing, and this is what humility is, by the way, is, is I am important, not more important than anyone else or less important, but I'm as important and that um, I, I, if I step into my power and authority, that's a good thing. Thank you. Yeah. Let's open it up. Yeah. <coughs> Questions, yeah. I, I, I was finding as a two that my biggest uh, need for growth, at least for in early stages, has been not giving advice. And yes. I mean, I heard you say something about it, but it's like well, that was my whole one. You know, oh, you you know, you have a uh, you're having a problem with sniffles. Yes. Um, do you ever use a nitty? I mean, it's just right. like <laughs> yes. yeah. And then being sometimes offended when people, like you said, yes. you know, didn't, uh, yeah. And that thing about feelings, it's like. You know, it takes me sometimes several hours to know what I'm feeling. Yes, <laughs> yes. Those are good ones. And exactly, it's a little bit related to what Kathy was saying. It's like, maybe I don't know what's best for you, and maybe it's none of my business um, to really kind of pull our energy in a little bit around thinking that we know what, what will help people or what's best. And that can be intrusive because it's, again, our unconscious desire to create some sort of usefulness uh, or, or way in. Yeah. Yeah. Are, could twos be more likely to be like alcoholics or addicts? Just the whole idea of needing to have humility and, you know, thinking sometimes you're better than, but also <coughs> infinitely worse than others. Well, I th I'll, I'll speak to this and then anyone else can want to say something. I think, I think we... I think all types have, you know, tendency to be to be addicted to things. I think it means different things for different types. I think for us, it's sometimes a way of numbing out the emotions that we don't want to feel, escaping into something that feels good. Because twos also, I think we can be a little bit like sevens in that we also like pleasure. Um, you know, we like to have fun. Um, and so I think there can be a way of, oh, it, it, I want to feel good and not feel bad. And, and I'm feeling bad and I don't really want to feel these feelings and so I need to escape. So I think there is a way that sometimes we can eat too much, watch too much TV, drink too much, some of us, as a way of escaping from a difficult feelings. But what, what do you all think? Anything you want, anyone wants to add and please uh, hold the mic if you do. 
Yeah, I'll add. <clears throat> um, I, as I said earlier, grew up with an alcoholic dad and a codependent mom, and lots of uh, kudos for being enthusiastic and being sort of sent to my room if I had anything negative to say about anything. So um, as a way of coping with that, food became my friend. Mm -hmm. Mine too. So I, I must say that um, I, you know, I became addicted to food the same way my dad was addicted to alcohol, no question about it. And it, I learned at a very early age that, you know, food was my friend and food made me feel good for the moment. And food worked and th I'm, I'm thankful today that I had it during those tumultuous years, but um, it, it just like our, our, our habitual <laughs> uh, behaviors, it don't work as time goes on. Food certainly did not work as time goes on when my weight was climbing up, 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 and I realized I had to take a look at what I was doing. So th therein started my sort of spiritual search. But yeah, absolutely, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm in recovery from for food addiction, and um, you know I work with it every day. So I think that it's, it's a good moment to say, I think sometimes we don't know what we need and we can neglect our needs, but then we can overindulge some needs. And that was true for me. It was almost like I, food was one of the things I had control over around how to meet, like I can meet my need for food. And even today, like I love to figure out what I'm going to make for dinner and think about grocery shopping and make it and eat it. And I mean, that is a, it takes up a lot of space in my life, but it's, it's almost like other needs that I can't meet so easily by myself, like needs that you need to get from contact with other people. It's like it all gets channeled into food uh, and the meal I'm going to eat, you know, thinking about dinner at lunchtime, you know, it's right. like, it's like that's something I can control around meeting my needs. So I'll tend to overdo that and underdo other things. Yeah. I think the other thing is, um, I you know, um, alcohol. I'm from an alcoholic family, so that that was always kind of <coughs> the default for the family. So I kind of stayed away from it, so I could stay conscious and helpful. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the other things. But I also one of the things I love about Aranio and B's approach, the subtype and instinctual drives. I think had a completely different flavor because I think the self preservation. Um, you know, we're more unconscious. I think we're more unconscious. And I would just, th I mean, I walk through the house and throw things in my mouth. You know, I don't care what it is, a cough drop or nuts or uh, there's always something going in my mouth or I'm talking. You know, it's like, I, I think it's mom. You know, I mean, I think right, it's the mother. Right, right, it's yes. the love. It's, you know, it's love. Yes. It's, it's some aspect of unconscious and loving oneself. Yes, and self-preservation instinct, having that as a dominant thing is connected to some issue with the mother. You know, sometimes not getting what you needed in a certain way. Um, and staying attached to that, either by being staying attached to mom or staying attached to being distant from mom. Um, but then the self, the social is is connected to the father, the social instinct mm -hmm. dominant connected to the father, some sort of issue there. And the sexual instinct dominant is connected to the mother, child, father, mother, father, child triangle. Mm -hmm. So it's the Oedipal complex. Sometimes usually ben you, you are somehow can, you know, caught up in that triangle. Uh, daddy's favorite, you know, mommy's little boy. You know, sometimes there right. is a divorce and the child ends up being closer to the, to the opposite sex parent. So that's just something to know about that. Yeah, and I just want to um, um, say that, I, you know, I learned a lot, like I've done uh, Rizzo Hudson work and I've done, you know, Helen Palmer work and I've done work with um, Aranio and B. And um, there's a certain richness to the typing and then there's another level of, richness to the subtyping and then there's the instinctual drives and it gets richer and richer mm -hmm. and richer and mm -hmm. I just want to say that the, the the journey is long and deep mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes it's yeah. as much as you own. yeah Nico could you say something to how the dynamic develops that one subtype ends up on the bottom in terms of how it relates to for example what you just said the uh, 
Um, so triangle. so there's there tends to be one subtype, one instinct. We all have all three instincts. One tends to get overdone. It like takes up too much space. So self-preservation, for instance, you feel like your life is all, always threatened, even when it's not, you know. Um, then there's one that's usually in the second place. It's a little bit more in normal range that can be overdone or underdone. And then there's one that's at the third that we call it a repressed instinct. So these are biological drives or energies. And so we believe that it's more than a blind spot, we actually need to be like pushing it down. Um, and again, these sequences, we call it the instinct sequence, um, is also important. So what your repressed instinct is, is very interesting. So people who have self-pres repressed actually put themselves in danger. Um, and people who have social repressed can sort of not be so attuned to a group, can say sort of uh, things that sort of are tone deaf to the social environment or damage their reputation. Um, people who are sexually repressed can not always uh, feel, they can sort of give up on relationships or intimacy or uh, or being attractive enough, that kind of thing. So I don't want to go too much into that since we're still in, um, yeah, and I believe that it comes, we believe that it comes, It's we're born with that, just like we're born with type. I can't prove it, you know, that's our theory, is that we, when we came into the world, we don't come in as a blank slate, we come in with uh, both our type and our instinct and probably even our <laughs> sequence. But of course, environment also shapes us, uh, but not in that profound way. Back there. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the gifts or the positive points of being a two? I'm kind of feeling. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, so um, the one thing I'll say to that is it is, Claudio Naranjo would say, this is an ego game. Right, we're talking about ego, so it's not. Com it's important to recognize that it's not completely positive. That said, we also don't want to get demoralized right. by right. focusing so much on what's difficult that we don't always also recognize what's really actually also true, which is that twos have a lot of positives and strengths. So, anyone want to say something to that, Michael? Yeah, sure. yeah um, I feel like I'm. I'm. I'm very grateful for the work that I've found um, as a coach because I I get to be, you know, all this attunement to others and um, wanting to help others, wanting to support um, because I get to be in a role where I have a clear role of doing that. It gives me a way to kind of use those strengths for good in a conscious way and not in a way where I'm, you know, I have to watch out when you know, when a client is giving me praise or giving me a testimonial or something like that, I can feel my temptation of inflation. Yeah. But, um, but that's, uh, you know, I think yes. that and my own experience is um, th the realm of love. It's everybody's realm. Mm. And as a two, it feels to me that... Um, if, if there's something around a gift around love as a two, mm. yeah. um, you know, not more than all of you guys mm. necessarily, but um, yeah, that's what I'd say. Well said. I want to build on what you said around being a coach. I'm, as a therapist, people would sometimes say to me, like, D doesn't it get tiring listening to people talk about themselves all day? <laughs> no. And I would say, no, it does not. I actually enjoy it. I'm interested. It's easy for me to empathize with others. It's easy for me to be really, really interested in a genuine way in people. Yeah. Yeah. I love I love people and I love talking about people and I love hearing people tell their stories and I'm moved by people's experiences. And I think, so I think that's really true. And so I actually switched careers at one point because I thought, what am I doing being an academic? Like I need something where I'm more involved in people's lives. And mm -hmm. so it's quite easy. And another good thing is like you're saying, Michael, I think part of our, when we're dedicated to doing Doing the work on ourselves, we become even better at that. Mm -hmm. Because I know being a therapist was really, training to be a therapist was great for me because it taught me about boundaries. It taught me that I need to be aware of my own stuff mm -hmm. so it doesn't get in the way of the other person. Yeah. And I think my deep desire to be on the high side really truly helpful to that person in a deeper way, not just in a way I'm getting something back, but in a way that I'm really gonna you know, help them, you know, uplift them. 
is if I'm doing my own work and and taking my like doing my own personality stuff, like that actually helps them, you know. And so I think that can really help us when we see that in owning my own stuff and making sure that my biases aren't getting in their way, it's like win-win, which feels great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jerry, you want to say add something to that? You spoke a little bit about the mirroring aspect and how our, you know, we have a strong desire to be mirrored and being a healthy two is like one of the best things I can do so that I can show up and mirror something that might be yes. a blind spot for the people in my community. Yes, yes. We're good at seeing what's, what's good in other people that needs yeah. to be affirmed. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Other, yeah, Nancy. Um, and if this isn't the right time to, to speak to this, you can defer me a bit. Um, so I was just really struck how much everybody was talking about the kind of ca chameleon aspect mm -hmm. of two. But I have always thought of three as being so chameleon. Mm -hmm. So Good seeing question. that yeah. blending of those mm -hmm. two, but then I'm a one, and then somebody talked about, you know, as a two, you know, needing to stop giving advice. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's part of what a one yeah. has to yeah. do. So I, I don't know if it's a, a wing thing, or but I'm just seeing there's like this this continuum or something mm -hmm. as we're going around, and I'd like to understand more about that continuum. Sure, I mean, I, I, I think it's just to say that this it is a circle, right? And that circle is meaningful, and so, um, in some ways, each type is sort of a blending of the two types around it. Now, we de-emphasize wing, wings only because we think before we had this really good subtype approach that comes from Naranjo, um, people overemphasized wings as the reason why two people of one type can differ. Uh, and we think it's really important that, that wings not carry that load of saying two fours are different because one has a three wing and one has a five wing. No, 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 the subtypes is a much better explanation for why two types differ within one type. However, the wings do, our wings do flavor us. And mm -hmm. so we often do share similarities. Right. Although I think it's important in self-observation not to outsource things. Like I work really hard, so that means I have a three wing. I think twos work really hard. Mm -hmm. I think I think twos are very driven. Um, it's just we slight, do it slightly for a different reason. Oftentimes we're driven because in working really hard, I'm doing something for somebody else as opposed to just the task in and of itself and what it makes me, maybe the way it makes helps me achieve as opposed, which is what threes tend to be a little more focused on. Um, but I also think that um, you started off by oh, chameleon. So twos and threes are both shapeshifters, mm -hmm. the biggest shapeshifters on the Enneagram. Now we do it in slightly different ways, but we both shapeshift and we're both very good at, again, sort of bringing out certain aspects of ourselves and de-emphasizing depending on our context or the people we're with or what we want to happen in a relationship. Mm -hmm. So I would say mm -hmm. that's just something that twos and threes share in general as a characteristic. However, threes do it in a slightly different way mm -hmm. and for slightly different motives than the twos do. And so it's just important to, to know both the similarities, I think, and the way we are on a continuum, but also the distinctions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, because like, as a one, I, I, I have shape-shifted, you know, sure. so, so just seeing that, oh. It's often a matter of, blending? it's often a matter of degree. Like yeah. ones don't shape shift as much as we do, right? Ones have internal standards of certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And we are, I'm much more morally flexible than a one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not afraid to admit it. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Steve. The, on, the, on the chameleonic note, um, nines also are, can be yeah. chameleonic, can adapt to any situation and lose their sense of self. Mm -hmm. And when Michael was talking about thinking it was a not, you know, being a not yeah. Yeah, for a while, and then yeah. suddenly, what? Yes. I'm not? Yeah. And I, when, as you were talking, I was getting a little panicky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Steve's a nine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God, do I have to rethink this whole thing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah. so there is a great similarity in that chameleonic element. Right. And I also think there's also something called lookalikes, right? So there's, there's the fact that twos and threes are right next to each other, and we share some aspects, sure. although different, there are distinctions. Twos and nines are big lookalikes, probably two of the biggest lookalikes on the Enneagram. So it's not really, a, it's not too big a surprise that someone would mistype themselves as a nine. Um, I do think, again, it's it's good to know, and by the way, as a commercial, for in the back of my book, The Complete 
Enneagram, I have an appendix where I have pairs of types and every pair of types and how they're similar and how they're different. I think there are a lot of similarities between two and nine, but it's also important to know that there are differences. And I do think, I wouldn't even say that nines shape shift in exactly the same way. Like they don't turn into something else than sort of the way twos and, not, and threes do. It's more that they blend. You know, it's kind of more of a blending in to create harmony and avoid tension and conflict. The motive, like the motive is different. So the reason why and slowly how they do it, although they do something very similar, almost the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just have a question because I'm a nine and I'm like Steve right now freaking out about the two. <laughs> but so having studied yeah, the Enneagram for a long time <laughs> very, very. with the panel basis, what do you trust to know? Because there's diagnostic computer tests now that you can take. No, no. no there, yeah, that, I wouldn't trust the, don't trust the tests well, yet. Yeah, yeah. came out self test yes. nine, so I was grateful, but now I'm going yes. two. So here's a difference, here's a difference. The nines in the audience are now wondering if they're two. Yeah. When the twos were in the audience, we did not wonder if we were nines. No, no wondering. No. That's one difference, right? So nines, they, it's almost like they can't help entering into another perspective, you know, blending with that perspective. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's one thing to say. Yeah, Delia. Well, just to piggyback on that, as a nine. <laughs> So, <laughs> one thing I've been sitting with uh, during this panel discussion is kind of a question about identification and about defense as an identification with something yes. egoically yes. as opposed to, you know, knowledge of allness, right? Yeah. So is it possible that the two is... <coughs> Um, that the shape shifting of the two is is kind of an identification with the other, rather than a a recognition, perhaps in the nine, as like a a, a oneness with the other. Yeah. A partaking in. Per, yeah, blending yeah. with. Yeah, merging almost kinesthetic. So, so good question. So the 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 main defense mechanism of type three is identification. So yes, what we do is sort of like that. Only what threes do is exactly like that. And we'll hear about that next. Uh, but what twos do is a kind of identification, but I would say it's almost more of a, like our main defense, defense mechanism is repression. So it's almost like going unconscious to parts of ourselves that won't match up with you, you know, and accentuating parts of ourselves that will, you know. So it's a, it's a subtle distinction, but it is a distinction. And yeah. And, and for me too, um, the shape shifting wasn't about so much about identifying with them. And it was about, look what else I'm willing to do. Yes. For you. For you. Yes. Yeah. It was yeah. another Yeah, it's almost offering. like it's yeah, it's almost like we don't turn ourselves into the role model of that thing. Yeah. We sort of more turn ourselves into something someone that can love you the be better yeah. than anyone else, yeah, you know. You to stay near us. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a little more of a seduction, yeah. seduction. than an than in a turning into wholesale. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I just bringing up some some experiences that I've had with patients that I've that I've treated and um there is a way where, at all costs, I want to find a way to connect with you, and so um, I can I, I can I can allow space for you, but I I'm gonna I'm gonna turn myself into um, I'm gonna re, I'm gonna dumb down certain aspects or build up certain aspects some way where I can get a little bit closer to you. And, and yes. And it's it's really and, a survival thing. Um, and I don't know if this is it exactly, but it's almost like threes turn them into to, to the ideal of who, what you think is successful or attractive. We turn ourselves into what we think yes. you should want. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because it doesn't really have to do with, yeah. identi with identification. Right. I yes. mean, it's like, I don't want to be you. I don't yeah. want to be like you. But I want to figure out a way to get to get close to you. Yeah. And to, you know, Turning you know. ourselves into your perfect partner right. as opposed to who you might yeah. Want, want and to, to be to make it yeah. easier for them to be with us. Yes, to smooth the way. Yeah, to create rapport is what I like to say. Well, we it's will very have to leave. We will have to. We will have to leave it there, unfortunately, because we're out of time. Uh, but thank you too so much. Receive. <laughs>